Well, good evening. Nice to see you here. I want to thank the uh, Virginia Tech uh, Institute for Policy and Governance for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, the title of tonight's talk is Moving from Healthcare to Health, Back to the Future with Primary Prevention. What I want to tell you is we have an opportunity in this country, a critical understanding of a posture of primary prevention, of health, that we have lost sight of. It is not new. It was understood by the ancients, and it has been responsible for most advances and backsliding in human health and prosperity over the centuries. Coupled strategically and proportionately with our current health care dominated model, the advances could be astounding. Yet if we fail to meaningfully and systematically recapture this posture, the present health care driven model, ironically, will enable shorter lives for many and eventually bankrupt us and rob millions of people of their potential for health and prosperity, their pursuit of happiness. So let me tell you a story. It's about Jason in a remarkable day. Jason is five, five and a half, he'd say. He plays soccer, swims, does Cub Scouts. He is bright, energetic. He has a grandfather who is in his 70s and a baby sister. His mother and father give him a good home. One day, Jason went to school, walking there, as he usually did, with his grandfather. Later that morning, the school nurse called to have him brought home because he had a fever of 101.9. He was listless and complained that his body hurt. His anxious mother was at work, but luckily, his grandfather lived nearby. Jason's grandfather came to get him and brought him to the doctor. The doctor did a test. Jason had influenza, the flu. The doctor prescribed antivirals and gave Jason's grandfather instructions for rest and fluids and what to do if Jason got worse. By the next day, Jason was a bit better. And the day after, his fever was gone and he was playing again. But his baby sister was fussier than usual. His grandfather felt lightheaded. Later that afternoon, the daycare center called to have Jason's sister brought home because of a fever. Jason's father was still out of town on business, and his grandfather, who was watching Jason, felt like he had his own fever coming on. He went to get the baby, and all three of them went back to the doctor. Jason's mother was too worried to stay at work, even though she had an important deadline. The doctor did the flu tests. The baby was negative, but Jason's grandfather was positive for the flu. The doctor prescribed antivirals for both of them. Jason's mother took off work the next day to care for her dad and the baby. The baby was very fussy, and Jason's mom was very stressed. The baby had loose stools and spit up more than usual, but was still able to nurse. But Jason's grandfather was worse. By the next day, the baby was better and had no fever. But Jason's grandfather was weak and feverish and complained of severe body aches. He was having trouble drinking enough, and his breathing was getting labored. Jason's mother called the doctor, and the doctor said to take him to the emergency department. From the emergency department, Jason's grandfather was admitted to the hospital, but still he got worse. He was transferred to the ICU. Jason's mother asked her church family to pray for her dad, an elder at their church. They did. The next day, her dad got worse. Still away on business, Jason's, Jason's father cut his tri trip short to come home. Three days later, Jason's grandfather had finally seemed to turn a corner. In the two days that followed, he was sitting up in his hospital bed and breathing more comfortably. He was discharged the next day and sent back to his daughter's home to recuperate. The time and expense had caught the family completely off guard. But the family was grateful that everyone was returning to health. Jason's mother had missed some important work assignments. But her boss was understanding, and she was thankful it had not been worse. She resolved next year not to be too busy 
to get a flu vaccine for her family, and she and her husband went and got vaccinated that weekend together. She was shocked to see all the different medical bills and statements come in the mail. She had to make a special folder to keep them all. When she totaled them up, they were over $28,000. But fortunately, the family's share of the bills was just over 900. Jason's mother reflected again. It had been a very hard, very frightening 11 days for her and her family, but it could have been much, much worse, she thought. It could also have been a different story about Jason and a different remarkable day. Jason is five, five and a half, he'd say. He plays soccer, swims, does Cub Scouts. He is bright, energetic. He has a grandfather who is in his 70s and a baby sister. His mother and father give him a good home. One day, Jason went to school walking as he usually did with his grandfather. The health department was giving flu shots there at the school that day. His grandfather signed the form, and because Jason was a little scared, took the opportunity to get his own vaccine. After watching his grandfather, Jason was brave and didn't even wince. The shots cost $30. Later that day, Jason's grandfather took him to swim practice. It was a good day. The end. So what do these stories, based on millions and millions of true stories, tell us? We are having the wrong conversation in our country. We are talking about, we are focused on, and spending, and spending, and spending on care. We need to talk about, need to be focused on, and need to spend more on prevention. Psychologists understand if you, if you hope for A and reward for B, you are mostly going to get more B. For decades now, we have been hoping for health and rewarding for health care, so care is what we get. We therefore find ourselves the richest country in the world spending $8,200 per head on health care, $2,800 more than the next closest country, Norway. But you only need care when, like Jason's family in the first story, you are sick. We need prevention. We need health every day. It's often said, follow the money and you will find the answer. So let's do that for a moment with our federal budget. Let's look at the spend. In the United States in 2011, we spent $769 billion, that's 21% of the entire federal budget, more than the $718 billion we spent on defense for three health care programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and the state, health, uh, state children's health insurance program. These are entitlements. They are growing. In that same federal budget, we spent only $54 billion on discretionary public health spending, an amount that is shrinking and is less than 1.5% of the non-deficit non federal budget. That discretionary funding covers many programs that also provide some care. Ryan White, Community Health Centers and Family Planning, almost all of the CDC's budget, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the National Institutes of Health, the Indian Health Service, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and the FDA. Writ larger, our entire economy of $14.5 trillion has about 18% of its activity, $2.6 trillion in its, health, in its health sector. That's more than the entire gross domestic product of the United Kingdom and most other countries. For that, we are ranked 37th overall in health by the World Health Organization right between Costa Rica and Slovenia. We are ranked 46th for infant mortality and 38th in life expectancy. If this were the Olympics, not only are we not on the podium, we didn't even come close to making the finals. Our population health status does not reflect the greatness of our nation, yet our system is perfectly engineered to get the results we're getting. Do we need to re-engineer re it? Do we need to focus on care or prevention? But don't we need this health care? Don't we need more health care? Isn't the money we are spending on care being spent rationally to maximize our investment in the quality of people's lives, 
to enable our health and prosperity, our pursuit of happiness? Consider this. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, and based on Health and Human Services data, a small share of us account for a significant share of health expenses. In 2009, almost half of all health spending was used to treat just 5% of us. Half of all health spending on 5%. In the Medicare program, $586 billion in 2011, nearly one-third of expenditures went to care for those of us in our last few months of life, nearly one-third. I have been there personally with loved ones. It is human to want the best for them, but it is not sustainable, and there is a substantial population health cost that we are not factoring in. In the Medicare and Medicaid programs, people who are eligible for or entitled to both programs, so-called dual eligibles, number about 9 million out of a U.S. population of 310 million. Yet state and federal governments spend 300 billion on this health care accounting for 15% of Medicaid beneficiaries, but almost 40% of the spend. Jason's story was about the flu, but it could have been about many other preventable situations, whooping cough or a bike accident with and without a helmet, or often preventable diseases like diabetes and heart disease. It could have been about elimination of standing water, where West Nile virus causing mosquitoes breed, or a prescription pill party from Grandpa's supply when Jason was a teenager. It could have been about Jason's exposure to smoking or a non-smoking grandfather and the presence or absence of Jason's lung cancer from secondhand smoke many years later. In fact, it could have been about any of many circumstances where an ounce of prevention is the true need. But systems do not exist in our communities and our nation are not committed robustly to provide them. We tinker, we surge, but we do not sustain primary prevention systematically and systemically. But we have before. Until the modern medical era, this was the primary tool available to us. The healing arts were not so nearly as useful. We relied historically on prevention. We have lost that focus, and we can regain it. Jason's first story of a family's encounter with a serious illness is often told. There are many variations. The second story, about a day that's centered around primary prevention, where easy, healthy choices are naturally or deliberately made, is rarely heard. It is not very interesting. Nothing happened. It's a wonderful story about life being lived and happiness being pursued, but there is no adverse event to count as having not occurred. If you did not know about the first story, there is no savings to point to, no bill for $28,000, in fact, the shots are not even 100% effective. It cost $30, and it hurt, and took time. And for what? The family stayed healthy all year. At least that family, that time. So this is the conundrum of prevention. We all say that we want it, but we don't want to be inconvenienced or pay for things not to happen. Lawmakers rarely have constituents call and say, you know, you're not providing enough messaging for me to reduce the likelihood that I will forget or not bother to wear my bike helmet. They do get calls about funding for treatment or research for traumatic brain injury. This is human nature. It's human. And as a media maxim, if it bleeds, it leads underscores. We focus on the trail on the train derailment, not the well-maintained track. All prevention is not created equal and does not generate the same return on investment. When we're, what we are talking about here is primary prevention. When most people think of prevention, they are thinking about secondary or tertiary prevention. And certainly most of us can be forgiven for not understanding or caring that there are different kinds of prevention with different costs and benefits. When healthcare providers like me talk about prevention, they are usually talking about secondary prevention, screening for and detecting a disease before, before it gets bad, like a mammogram or tertiary prevention, treating an existing disease so it doesn't get worse, like keeping blood sugar under control in diabetes. But the power and the return on investment is greatest in primary prevention, making sure an illness or an injury doesn't happen in the first place, like Jason and his grandfather getting a flu shot. So what's the big picture? Being alive is certainly an indication of the absence of premature death. And we can measure this in populations by looking at life expectancy. This is a key measure. 
Our U.S. life expectancy of 78.6, remember, puts us at 38th in the world. Are we getting what we pay for, and is this the fault of health care? Consider what leads to poor health and premature death or lower life expectancy in the population. 40% of life expectancy is attributable to behaviors or choices, what we eat, how much we exercise, whether we smoke or abuse other drugs, get vaccinated, use seat belts, wear bike helmets, are breastfed, and more. There are many ways to modify these and make them the more natural or the easier choice, like in-school flu vaccination was for Jason. 30% of life expectancy is attributable to our genetics and development, what we inherit, our genes, the health of our mother and father before we're born. We're coming to understand that even some of this is modifiable through primary prevention strategies or primordial prevention strategies, like folic acid for women of childbearing age. 15% of our life expectancy is attributable to social circumstances that influence health, education, income, and housing primarily. 10%, 10% is attributable to health care. That's access to care and provision of care for different needs. Very important to individual health when it's needed, but not a driver of population health. 5% of life expectancy here in the United States is attributable to environmental exposures. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the places we live. Let's consider the different types of prevention in a little more detail. Primary prevention is about preventing an illness or a condition from ever occurring in the first place. It has abundant forms, from immunizations like Jason's flu shot, to physical activity, to eating right, and targeted education. These preventions across populations almost always save money and improve health. The result is a positive return on investment and true population health improvement, almost always for almost everyone who, who engages in them. When we talk about prevention in public health, it's primary prevention that's top of mind. Secondary prevention is about identifying a disease or condition before it becomes a more serious problem. This is the kind of prevention that most people, and especially people in the healthcare industry, think about when they say prevention. This is the screening test, the mammogram, the pap smear, and the HIV test. These are very worthy interventions, and properly targeted, they do save money and improve health, properly targeted but not always. They must be chosen carefully. And applying them to populations can sometimes be very beneficial. They can also, however, be costly in terms of both health and dollars. We know the results of a screening test can be misleading or wrong. Few tests are perfect or gold standards. Sometimes a screening test can result in the worrying answer that the test is positive for a problem even when there isn't really a problem or one that will result in a bad outcome. This is a false positive. The worry may lead to actions taken that are not necessary or are even harmful. Screenings can also have false negatives, resulting in reassurance that is not really true. So these interventions must be carefully applied. Applying some secondary prevention to a whole population can have very different consequences than applying it to selected individuals. Tertiary prevention is about stopping an already identified disease or condition from getting worse or doing more damage, like the antivirals Jason's doctor prescribed for him. This type of prevention is critical to people with established conditions and is the focus of most of our activities and most of our expenditures in the healthcare sector. It takes many forms, from blood glucose monitoring and diabetes management to bariatric surgery, surgery and clot-busting drugs used in strokes. The fact is, however, that in this kind of prevention, the condition is already present. We are trying to treat it, providing care to prevent further loss of health and life. But it's, ex but it's expensive, very expensive, and health is already compromised. In our story, we can speculate that the early antivirals may have saved Jason's grandfather's life. Since I wrote it, I can do more than speculate. They did. So clearly, health care applied at the right time is critical. But is this the best thing to do if we have a choice? Wait until the train derails and then fix it instead of maintaining the track. The flu shot could have prevented or made the whole scenario less likely. So here's a key point. We keep talking and spending almost all of our energy 
almost all of our thought leaders in our research, our economic analysis, and our dollars on the 10% care rather than the 40% prevention. If we really want to be a population with better health and greater prosperity, our conversations and focus have to change, and thought and research dollars have to follow. But these dollars will save others, 10 to 1 by most estimates. Not all health conditions are the result of failures in primary prevention, to be sure. But nearly 40% of what will shorten our lives as human beings results from behaviors that we can modify. Health care, for all we invest in it, only contributes about 10% to our longevity. Primary prevention, preventing ill health from developing in the first place, is today most often the harder choice, the unnatural one, the path of most resistance. Typically, care, care and cure are someone else's responsibilities. They are services that we receive. Primary prevention is something we do for ourselves or those we care about individually or collectively. Primary prevention may take work, yes, but not more work than secondary or tertiary prevention. And properly designed, it can seem like the most natural and obvious thing in the world, like walking or biking to school was a generation ago. Think of Jason's story. Which version, which version took more work overall? Certainly the first version, where Jason's grandfather got sick, had a great deal more time and expense involved. This is obvious. And it could have ended tragically, so the risk was greater. The flu vaccine version took work too, but even if you consider this work annually over a lifetime, isn't the time and risk and expense less on both an individual and societal basis? Do we think it's better to change our oil every several thousand miles or wait until we hear grating noises from the engine? Refocusing on primary prevention will take deliberate societal and cultural supports, business leadership, community engagement, and government support. This will take all of us, or at least a critical mass, to demand and assure that the healthy choice can truly become the easy, natural choice again, but not by accident and not merely by the efforts of a few trained healthcare workers. That is not our focus. Care is. The healthcare sector will not solve this problem alone. In fact, we in healthcare have a conflict in doing so. Well, people don't need our care services. Someone said it's not the stagecoach owners who are going to develop railroads. So let me say this one more time. 40% of our lifespans attributable to our own modifiable behavior. More than the 30% attributable to our genetic and developmental backgrounds or the 15% attributable to our social circumstances. Yet for decades, our conversation has been about the end and not the beginning. The 10% of our lifespan is a population that's attributed to health care provided. But don't take some epidemiologist's word for it, though they are usually very trustworthy people, or mine. Look around. Think about now how nearly two-thirds of us in our communities are overweight or obese. Two-thirds. One in five just about one in five, still smoking. 15% or so still not wearing seatbelts. Only three quarters of babies ever breastfed and less than half breastfed at six months. Whole swatches of the country built for cars where walking or biking are risky, if not downright unacceptably dangerous or foolhardy. Only 43% of us getting an annual flu shot. Few people vigilant to eliminate standing water around their home during mosquito season and how few children now walk to school. Would we accept these statistics year in and year out if this were a ball team? Cub fans like me notwithstanding. Is, how's the humor gain on this? Is it okay? You can turn that up. So why are we okay with these statistics in this most important aspect of our lives? It's time to begin a different conversation. It's time to go back to the roots of the advances in human health and focus not on care, but on prevention, primary prevention. We must understand this is, this is an economic necessity in our country, so I propose a formula. The effort must be business-led, community-focused, and engaged, and government-encouraged. Businesses years ago came to understand the importance of a culture of safety. It saved lives and money. It helped businesses to prosper. Those who cut corners might make a quicker buck, might. But in the end, they paid a price. In prevention, there are three parts. 
building blocks to what businesses can do. First, create a culture of health for their own employees and their families. Second, help make the healthy choice the easy choice in their own space, in their own business model. Third, extend that culture to the community by providing leadership and support of community primary prevention activities. Some progressive businesses have already awakened to a culture of health. Understanding that a healthy, present workforce sustains the business's productivity, lowers costs, and fuels growth. Healthy workers and customers make for a better business condition. So business has a reason to lead. Even the healthcare sector with our inherent conflict often leads, understanding it's the right thing to do. Think of physicians, dentists, and nurses with flu vaccination rates 25% higher than the general population. But they can't do it alone. They are the usual suspects. This will require something more. They can't be the change agents that the wider business sector, large and small, can be and must be. Employers of all sizes are intimately engaged with their communities, whether a neighborhood, a state, or a country. They can lead and spark positive community change and constructive engagement. After all, people in their communities often work for them. This is powerful. Finally, we in government have, a walk, have to walk the talk. We have to help our businesses engage, think creatively about how we free dollars from care to prevention, and how we do primary prevention in our own space. So I hope each of you will leave here today wanting to have those important conversations with others in your community. If you are a business or work for one, think about one thing you could do in each area. Employee health, an action to make the healthy choice the easier choice in your own business model, and providing leadership to engage in primary preventions in the communities you operate in. Help make Jason's truly remarkable day remarkably healthy and remarkably common. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'd like to thank uh, John Dreisner for talk, coming to talk tonight and helping us to kind of get a better understanding of preventative, of primary pr prevention. Um, an effort that really is business-led, community-focused and engaged, and really should be encouraged by our government. Uh, we look forward to continuing tonight um, and taking what we've learned tonight and applying it to our homes, our work, and our community life. Um, my name is Sarah Lyon Hill. Um, I'm a doctoral student in planning, governance, and globalization, and I'm a member of Community Voices. Um, Dr. Dreisner, we really appreciate you coming here tonight, uh, your leadership and vision for community health, um, and yes, and just for being here. Thank you. Um, we're going to switch gears here a little bit as uh, Marcy Schnitzer is going to come up here and engage us in a question and answer section so we can think more deeply about our roles as individuals and community members um, in primary prevention. Marcy. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. You're welcome. My name is Marcy Schnitzer, and I am a research associate with the Institute for Policy and Governance, also um, adjunct faculty here at Virginia Tech. Um, I'd like for any of you who have questions of Dr. Dreisner uh, to engage with us in this important conversation this evening. Um, I'll be calling on members of this audience uh, who would like to talk with or ask questions and share their insights um, with Dr. Dreisner about his experiences and insights into primary prevention and the role of business and change that he sees so urgently needed. So I wanna open up this conversation to you um, to ask questions. If you have a question, would you please uh, raise your hand and we can bring a microphone to you? Yes. You're brave. <laughs> Um, thank you very much um, for your vision, ideas, and for being here with us tonight. Uh, I am a doctoral student here at uh, Virginia Tech in the Institute for Policy and Governance in the PGG program, and I'm interested in, in sort of your paradigm for or paradigm shift necessary to move health into a more preventative 
um, paradigm. And so, you, so you know, you, I think that you outlined it in terms of um, business-led uh, and then government sort of walking the walk and talking the talk. What is your sense of where the role of education, both you know, primary, elementary, et cetera, fits into this formula um, for moving forward in a prevention sort of discussion? Thank you. Um, great question. Thank you for that question. Um, I think that's, uh, I think education is foundational and essential. Um, uh, the, the format of, of tonight's uh, talk uh, constrained me. I had to get kind of a lot of things in in 20 minutes. Uh, maybe I went a little bit over. I think it was pretty close. Um, but uh, uh, I, I have a model that I didn't have time to show today. Um, I can actually put it up on the screen since you asked such a great question. I'll do that. Um, let's see if it comes up. There we go. There we go. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, this is, this is what I call a healthy paradigm. It's kind of a theory, but it's kind of the way I view the world. Um, and you'll see there that there's a, there's a, a fundamental arrow that has education on it. And, and the way I see education um, is it's, a, it's, it's foundational to uh, the human experience, to, hu to human endeavor, and to reach, reaching a fullness of human potential, uh, which is necessary for both health and prosperity. And, and education, you know, I, I think about education and work as a continuum, and certainly people go back and forth between work and education. Uh, and really what education is, is, is work before you get paid for it. Um, but the, uh, but the, the idea uh, that, uh, you know, people have to be educated to, be a, to have a meaningful exchange with society, uh, to have uh, meaningful lives, uh, to be able to make their own way, and to learn about themselves. So that's also an, a critical component, I, I think. I think part of primary prevention, really, um, in, in some ways, is uh, educating children very early about how their bodies work, how they operate, and how to take care of them. Um, we don't really do a lot to teach our children how to care for themselves. Um, you know, uh, I think you know, many, many people uh, may know more about the inner workings of, of their first automobile uh, when, they, when they purchase it than they knew uh, about their own bodies and how to care for them uh, over a lifetime uh, when, they, when they first had awareness. So I think we have to do a lot better job of reaching down even, even uh, well before, well before uh, entry into formal education. Uh, to lay that groundwork. Thank you. Additional questions? Um, yes, over here. Oh. I wondered if you could give some examples of um, ways that you've seen healthy choices being made the easy choice or the, you know, however you said it. Well, if it was easy. No, We'd all well, be doing it. You didn't. You didn't say easy, but no, no. You know. uh, the, the, well, I mean, it, it, the easy or the more natural choice or the more deliberate choice. I, I think there's there are. I mean, there's really a host of things, and and I, and I don't mean to imply at all that there are not a lot of great things going on all over, all over the country, um, and, and particularly in the area of of, of obesity and overweight. Um, uh, but there are a lot of there are a lot of grassroots efforts. There are a lot of you know. Uh, uh, business-led and government-led efforts. Um, what, what I think we're lacking a little bit is al alignment and awareness because it's right now it's kind of something that we're doing, you know, and it's kind of out here, but we're really centered on on care and on treatment for for uh, uh, issues when they become a problem. The idea is, you know, um, I'm gonna I'm not really gonna worry about it until I need to fix it, and I think we really have to get back to this idea of, um, you know, you're much better off keeping what you have than relying on the fix. And, and prior to the modern medical era, you know, antibiotics were really first, you know, first sold commercially in, in, in about 1932. Uh, Fleming uh, described penicillin in 1928. Um, and, and I think that, that kind of began this, this modern march towards this idea that, that care uh, and, and, and technology and modern medicine can kind of solve all of our ills. Um, and to some extent, it, it does some of that. I mean, we're, you know, what we, what we have available to us is astounding. Um, but you can't get to, you know, you can't get too far along that continuum uh, until you reach a point of no return. Um, I think diabetes is a very good example of that. Once, once you develop diabetes, it can be treated. Um, uh, and if it's treated aggressively, it can even be treated, uh, you know, or controlled without medication um, in some cases. 
But once that machinery is turned on or off, depending on how you look at it, you really can't turn that clock back. And I, I, I did, I've done some addiction medicine um, in, in another uh, part, of, part of my, uh, my work here. And, and it's, it's a very similar circumstance for people that find themselves on a continuum from abuse, uh, or rather from, from uh, uh, recreational uh, misuse to uh, habitual misuse to abuse to addiction. And, uh, and, and once, you, once you kind of cross that, that, uh, that, that line, and it's a little bit different for, for different people, you can't really turn the page. Um, you can, you know, you can enter recovery, and you can be recovered your whole life, but you, you'll always have some changes, uh, some biochemical changes that have occurred as a result of kind of crossing that. So I think, I think the, uh, uh, the issue of, you know, what do we do? Um, one critical thing is I think we start to recognize that most of the things that we're talking about that we need to prevent are linked. Um, and again, short talk, don't have time to go into all of it, uh, but uh, uh, I and many others have a unified theory of, uh, of, of why we as a species do things that harm us uh, and do things to excess, whether it's uh, alcohol or food uh, or, or drugs or tobacco or gambling. Uh, for some people, it's exercise. For some people, it's work. For some people, it's uh, it's anything that we do to excess uh, that, that becomes harmful, and it's all linked um, uh, by a, a very old, very ancient neurochemical called dopamine in a reward center that sits in the middle of our brain called the dopaminergic reward center, the only part of the brain that, if you stimulate it, um, actually is inherently pleasurable. The parts of the brain, if you stimulate them, they're, they're just annoying, or, 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 or you have visual hallucinations or whatnot. At least that's what my neurosurgeon friends tell me. Um, so the, the idea that if we start to recognize that, that whether it's, whether it's a, a prescription drug abuse uh, or whether it's diabetes or whether it's tobacco um, or whether it's anorexia, anorexics may get, uh, you know, dopaminergic uh, stimulation from withholding rather than eating too much. Um, these things are all linked. Um, and, and we're kind of all in this together as human beings. And these are the things that we, 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 we can be victim uh, victims of or be led to or lead ourselves to uh, doing the excess. And I, I, and I use that victim word carefully, by the way, because part of that is informed by my work in, in addiction medicine where I've seen people start their addiction before they, were, before they reached their teens. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I believe in personal responsibility, but I also understand that sometimes people don't make true choices. Um, but until we recognize that, that there's a common link here and we're really kind of fighting the same thing, we're going to have trouble uh, addressing it because we kind of pigeonhole it. Well, that's obesity. Oh, that's substance abuse. Oh, that's tobacco abuse. But they're not, they're not, they're not really that much different. They're linked. And once we recognize that um, and, and realize that, uh, that these are things that, that human beings have suffered with for eons um, and, and, you know, animals even have trouble with because they, you know, goodness gracious, the dopamine, dopamine molecule, molecule, I remind myself, is ancient. It's in lizard brains. Dinosaurs had dopamine. Dinosaurs probably would have, would have, would have, would have uh, chain smoked themselves to death if they had the opportunity. You've seen that Far Side cartoon, I guess. <laughs> what really killed the dinosaurs? <laughs> Does that come close to answering your question? Well, I'm thinking more about things like kids walking or biking to school. Oh, okay, so great. So built How environment. How do you change that when you've got the conditions that we have now? Well, I, I have a I have a uh, I have a health policy advisor uh, who was a former uh, county commissioner, um, and uh, and also uh, spent some time in the legislature, and she's been going around to talk to her colleagues in in counties all over Tennessee to remind them of the power that they have, um, and they do, um, and of course you know if you live in in a, you know in a place where where you've, you've elected one of them you have power too because you put them in office to do that job. Um, and, and I think that's part of what I'm talking about. Uh, the idea that, you know, I, you, know, we, you know, any one of us individually can go to our county commission and say, you know, it's just not okay anymore to build, you know, to build spaces that are exclusive to the automobile, to build spaces without sidewalks, to build spaces without a safe place to bike. Um, and and, and we, we, we want something better. Um, when I or you do that as individuals, that's good. Um, when, when they start hearing that from people in the community that employ people uh, that are part of the tax base uh, that, that they're trying to attract to their community, that's even more powerful. Uh, that's why I say the business piece of this is really important. Um, 
but, the, uh, but I think those are the ways you start to, to make changes in the built environment. And it's not just, you know, it's not just an investment that, you know, oh, we've got to spend more money now because we've got to build sidewalks, we've got to spend more money because we've got to build a safe bike lane. Yes, maybe up front. Um, but if you think about some of those, some of those, some of those spends uh, as having a return on investment later on, not only in terms of the health of the population, but in the enjoyment of the community. Um, I know I, we were talking earlier today about the challenges of doing that in mountain country, you know, where we're fighting for, literally fighting for every inch of pavement um, because, you know, it's expensive to, uh, to build uh, roads in, in, in places like this. But imagine if we picked out some roads uh, and imagine if we made a safe bike lane where there's maybe even a barrier uh, between, the, uh, between the traffic and the, and the bikes uh, that are maybe multi-use, like, uh, you know, how many people have heard of the Creeper Trail? So, you know, bikes, walking, running is a shared use trail. Um, that's visited, I'm told, by thousands and thousands of people every year. Imagine if we had more spaces like that uh, in, 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 uh, in central Appalachia where people could come and enjoy the beauty that we, that we uh, benefit from around us uh, without literally taking their lives into their, into their own hands. How many of you have ever passed uh, a few bike riders on, on, one of our, on one of our winding mountain roads. Yeah. And you think, oh my, you know, what are they doing? You know, and you're, you know, you're almost scared to go by them, you know, because, you know, you, 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 some of us will cross the double yellow line to, to, stay, away from, uh, to stay away from the bike riders. Um, but I think that can, be, that, that can in turn bring real economic benefits and, and real attractiveness and pride of place uh, to our communities. And I think, um, to me, that's asset-based development. We just haven't really been thinking about it that way, and we haven't been thinking about that as being a real investment um, in, in our health. If we don't make those kinds of, if we don't sp spend on, on that kind of thing, uh, we'll be spending on the kind of thing that, you know, that we've been talking about tonight. And I think we really need to reverse that. The challenge is um, always that the, uh, uh, that, you know, people uh, uh, still, need, still need care, um, still want care. Uh, and so there's a period of time where we have some challenges with uh, what some people might call uh, bridging, bridging, that, bridging that gap before we, we do turn that around and we go back to the health that we enjoyed as a nation um, uh, just maybe 40 years ago. Now, there's some, in some ways, we've improved mar you know, markedly. Our infant mortality rates are far lower. Our longevity is, uh, our longevity is higher. But we're still facing uh, the potential for the first time in, in recent history to have a generation of, of people, uh, namely our children, living shorter lives than, than, than we ourselves are likely to. Thank you. Really appreciate your sharing uh, this evening. Awesome. Um, I come from a background with a, with a grandmother who, when I got a terrible, terrible burn from f a fire, put potatoes, sliced potatoes on it. <laughs> it worked. Um, my mother, yeah, yeah, it is a miracle. <laughs> um, and my mother was always a little skeptical of doctors. <laughs> and um, part, yeah, yeah, <laughs> not hate, but we had to go get our shots. But um, also, my husband's very oriented to homeopathy. And until the turn of the last century, I understood most of our physicians were homeopathists until the AMA came along. AMA, AMA came along. And um, I understand the only sculpture to a doctor in DC is a homeopathic doctor. So. With that background, I'm asking you if you think what's really running our health care in this country um, are the insurance companies, the drug companies, um, hospital well, I, I, corporations. I, I, and this is kind of um, a challenge to me when I think about it. I'm a financial advisor, and so you know a lot of these things are things that we invest in. At the same time, who's really running our show? And that's my question. We when are. it comes to Congress, especially. My, 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 answer is, my answer is we are running our show. We are running our because show. Because we are, we are getting what it is we want, you know, collectively. Now, you know, you may have, you know, a different idea about what you want, but collectively, um, as I said, we're, we're hoping for A, we're hoping for health, yeah. uh, but we're rewarding, we're rewarding for B, care. 
Uh, that's why we have 18% of our gross domestic product in, in the health sector. It is right. big business. It is huge. Exactly. It's bigger than manufacturing. Yeah. It's a service industry. We don't typically export a lot of it, so right. it doesn't help our uh, it doesn't help uh, our economy quite as much. Uh, some would argue, uh, as uh, as uh, industries that allow us to export, um, but it, it is a huge business. Um, yeah. Something that we all, you know, uh, you know, we we are all participating in. Um, it wouldn't the business wouldn't be there if we didn't want it and need it. Um, but but I suggest that um, we we've been kind of following following this. Um, and and uh, the, the health sector is an interesting sector, and I'm not an economist, but, uh, but I've heard economists say uh, that, uh, uh, that the health sector is one of the few places uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, the, in an economy where supply creates demand. Um, and right. more supply typically creates more demand. Um, and there have been lots of ways we've tried to rein that in over time. Uh, there's been things like uh, some, some folks have heard, heard about uh, certificates of need. Um, uh, and many states have, uh, you know, have essentially have rules that say you can't, you know, you can't build another MRI machine unless you can demonstrate a need in the community. Uh, because the concern is, you know, if there's an MRI machine on every corner, people will use them. Yeah. Um, and they don't necessarily need them. Um, and, uh, and, and so we've tried these strategies, but, but what I would say is um, we, are, we, we can't expect that industry, can't expect the stagecoach drivers to invent the railroad. We can't expect that industry to fix itself. Now that industry will, will you know, many in that industry will work hard to do the right thing, uh, you know, to reduce errors, to improve care, uh, to, you know, to make, uh, you know, to make, uh, uh, you know, care spaces more pleasant, uh, to, you know, to, to, uh, harness and use data to provide you know better and better increments of care, um, but but that's not going to fix that's not going to fix our, our problems and and we can't look to that industry and say you know you're not doing it right uh, because they're doing exactly what it is um, we are buying so you know they would say yeah, yeah we're doing pretty well thanks we're uh, you know we're 18 percent of gross in, in, domestic product. In other words, uh, I hear you and uh, that's that was going to be my other question. We spend time in Nicaragua, the second poorest country in the hemisphere, and yet healthcare is there for everybody, even us who are not citizens. And but, I don't want to go into that issue in a way. How's, but how's their population health? It is, I don't know the statistics, but up in the village that we go to, um, there are very few people there in the center when our people have to go use it. I, I, I don't know, that's a good question. I, I, That's a good question. I know a doctor um, that that uh, was assigned to a uh, to another South American country um, to take care of a of a of a very rural, isolated population, um, and uh, they had they had horrible uh, uh, rates of child death of, uh, of of maternal of maternal death. Um, they had uh, 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 lots of uh, people dying of diarrheal diseases. He went there with. Uh, uh, basically with a medical bag, really no supplies, no equipment. Um, and he turned that place around, but he didn't do it by providing care. He did it by uh, basic, fundamental, primary prevention, uh, which is kind of a fancy way of saying, you know, yeah. he made sure that people were drinking clean water. Yes. He, got, he got the women to breastfeed. Um, yeah. He made sure that the, uh, that the midwives who were delivering uh, the uh, village's babies uh, under, you know, yeah. understood germ theory, or if they didn't understand germ theory, they knew enough to wash their hands. Yeah. Um, really basic stuff. Um, and and that's, that's really what has helped turn around the health of populations um, uh, in history. Right now, there are places in the world, where we have an infant mortality in this country of right around six. Mm. Uh, there are places in the world, Afghanistan, for example, that has an infant mortality rate of 149. Right. Best in the world right now is Monaco, I think, at 1.8. Best in this hemisphere is Bermuda, I think, at 2.3, if memory serves. Um, we're sitting about 6. Uh, 6, 6.0 in this country. Tennessee, we're proud of the fact that we went from 7.9 to 7.4 last year. Um, but the point is that, that uh, you know, none of these numbers are fixed. Uh, if you look on my yeah. slide here, um, and this is a very important one, uh, and I, I, didn't, I didn't realize this right away because I took it for granted for a long time. Uh, if you look at the, uh, that circle, that oval, 
Uh, that's the genetic and, and developmental background, so something that, that's relatively fixed and we all kind of have to deal with. We, we, you know, we get what we inherit uh, and, and we right. get what we get from, uh, from mom and dad before we're born. Uh, but there's that, that rectangle that used to be blank space until I realized, oh my goodness, that's not blank space. That is, that is freedom, that is self-determination, that is economic inclusiveness, that is good governance. That is what provides, that provides uh, our nation and many other nations with a foundation uh, by which we can do all those other things in the center. Without that, um, you know, we don't have any of it. So, I, you know, again, um, my focus is on population health and not on the provision of care for any population because provision of care is a great thing to do um, and it's needed, you know, on an individual basis. But, but there, are, there are literally, you know, millions of people in this country that are focused on the provision of care in that 18% of gross domestic product that's the healthcare sector. So I'd like to think more about, about the importance of population health and, and what, what, what we can do to support that. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody has to ask you about the Affordable Health Care Act, I would assume. The title of it, of course, suggests that it's sustaining the very culture that you would like to see changed. But I'm simply curious to know what in that act might move the health system toward greater prevention, and where does that act fail to move uh, toward the kind of culture that you have so interestingly described? I think, pri I think primarily. Uh, that is that is that is insurance uh, insurance reform and payment reform. So it really, I don't think it really does a lot uh, uh, around what I'm talking about. I think it will. Uh, I think it will uh, potentially, um, if uh, if uh, ACOs, uh, uh, really accountable care organizations, uh, truly um, do what they're intended to do, and and don't become uh, you know uh, managed care. Uh, uh, managed care too. Um, I think there's some potential uh, to uh, to improve uh, the health of people who are in care, and 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 perhaps um, there there is some potential uh, if that really takes hold uh, and and and, and co goes to full fruition uh, to incentivize the health care sector to be concerned about population health, be concerned about people that are aren't currently covered lives. Uh, or aren't actively in services, but could eventually get to services. Um, but I am very pessimistic that that will that will be the case. And I'm pessimistic because, again, um, you know, you can't hope for A and reward for B and expect A to happen. Um, and 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 don't you know? Don't ask, you know, the stagecoach operator, um, you know, to uh, you know to 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 uh, create the railroad. Um, that's that's not what they're that's not what they're set up to do. That's not what they're designed to do. They're designed to provide, uh, you know, a, a certain array of services. So I think this has to be. If you know, and this is what we're doing. I mean, by and large, you know, the the issue of of of, uh, of, of focusing more on prevention is being, uh, you know, relegated to the healthcare sector, some governmental entities like me, um, and uh, and certain and certain interested others. One of the things we're doing in, in, in our state, in, in, in my, uh, in, 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 in my, with my team, uh, Tennessee Department of Health, is, is just beginning something we call our primary prevention initiative. Um, and the idea behind that is um, we, uh, uh, we actually provide a fair amount of care in Tennessee. We have 90,000 unduplicated patients that we provide primary care services for. We probably touch about uh, 900,000 Tennesseans a year with direct services and, and then you know, serve everybody else with, uh, with an array of other services. But can we get uh, our, our uh, 3,440 uh, 3, uh, 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 Tennessee uh, public health professionals out into their communities for a couple of afternoons a, mo a month to catalyze and engage in primary prevention activities? Not necessarily do, them, do it themselves, um, but, to, to, but to get their communities engaged to do things that will, that will help move that needle. Um, we're, we're right now in beta testing. Um, we, we hope to roll it out in uh, hope to roll it out in uh, in, in full in January, um, and there's some you know there's some things around around it to uh, to figure out. That's why we alpha tested it and beta tested it. 
When we alpha tested it, though, a, a kind of a neat thing happened. The story is not, the story is not fully, uh, uh, I can't give you the ending. Um, but, the, uh, but there's a big festival in the county that we, we, uh, we alpha tested this in. And we got about six people from the health department to think about what, what would they like to do, you know, to basically, uh, you know, help, you know, move the needle uh, in a primary prevention fashion in their, in their county. Um, and they decided they were going to look at uh, 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 reducing smoking in, 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 in the county, particularly reducing smoking in public places. You know, people shouldn't have to go to a public place and, and, and be exposed to, uh, you know, 60 plus carcinogens and side streams tobacco smoke. Um, and uh, so they, 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 they started talking about that and meeting with people. Um, long story short, turns out that they had connections that they didn't know about. There's a big festival, very big festival uh, in this particular county. Uh, and they're, they're very close to getting, a, getting the festival board to vote to go smoke free. It's on private property. They get to make the call. It's a tough call because, you know, a lot of their patrons, a lot of people that come to the festival, smoke. Um, but probably not more than half. Um, so uh, we'll see. But uh, we, can, we can be hopeful that that's the kind of thing that can start getting communities to make the healthy choice uh, the more natural or the easier choice. I believe we're out of time for questions. Um, Andy is going to wind us up for the evening, but please join me in thanking Dr. Dreisner once again. Thank you.